Good evening, people, and Merry Christmas. Today is the third day of Christmas. Um, so clearly Ginger's nap is in her little caroling cape, and I am wearing my uh, birthday boy Jesus sweater. It's, it's festive. It's Christmas. So, yes. Um, so, uh, as we continue through our worship series for the season from generation to generation, I wanted to use this opportunity um, on our Tuesday night Bible studies to take a closer look at some of the texts throughout that series. So tonight, I wanted to take another look at uh, the Christmas story, which I know we just had a couple days ago, uh, but... Uh, we're gonna get in. Uh, usually we read from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, but because this is such a familiar story, um, I thought it might be helpful if we um, heard it with a slightly different wording. So uh, this is from Eugene Peterson's translation in The Message. So from Luke 2. About that time, Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the empire. This was the first census when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone had to travel to his own ancestral hometown to be accounted for. So Joseph went up from the Galilean town of Nazareth up to Bethlehem in Judah, David's town, for the census. As a descendant of David, he had to go there. He went with Mary, his fiancée, who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger, because there was no room in the hostel. Okay, whole side translation tangent thing. So last year, like this was literally the entire sermon was me ranting about the translation of this word. Well, I mean, it was theologically relevant and anyway. Um, so um, I like how this is hostile instead of in. So um, first off, uh, anything that we think of as an in, like any kind of like bed and breakfast, like small hotel, whatever, didn't really um, exist in the first century. Um, even if it did, there wouldn't be one in somewhere as small as Bethlehem. And um, also uh, the word that is translated usually as in or uh, here is hostile is kataluma, which is the same word that is later translated in the story as the upper room where Jesus has his last supper with his friends. Like he's not going to some like hotel banquet hall or, or something. It's, it's, it's room. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, because like hotels weren't an option and because hospitality was so freaking important to people in the first century, especially in this region, um, they were staying with family. They were just in very, very crowded, crowded, crowded home. So um, like, you know, the usual family sleeping area is obviously taken by the usual family that lives there. And then any other family members who got there before Mary and Joseph, they're in uh, the guest room or like the, the spare room. Um, it would maybe be used for storage if there weren't people actively staying in it. Um, and then, so Mary and Joseph show up and they're more like the animal side of things because also uh, we have this very, um, westernized image of Jesus being like basically born in a barn or like a stable uh, also wasn't a thing in this area in the first century. Um, the animals would live like in the same, like almost living room as the rest of the family. There might be like kind of uh, two levels. So like the animals are like lower down. So they kind of like stay put and it's not a situation where you're half asleep and you're all cozy in your bed and then all of a sudden something grabs at your arm and hmm, the cat has snuck into your room. <clears throat> anyway, um, yeah, so they're like more on the animal side of things anyway. Hostel is, I guess, closer because, you know, it's kind of more of a sense of like a bunch of people all in, in one space rather than an inn where like, at least in like the modern sense of the word, we think of people as getting their own rooms. Um, anyway. Uh, so yeah, Eugene Peterson translates Cataluma as hostile was my, was my point. There were shepherds camping in the neighborhood. I love that, shepherds camping in the neighborhood. Um, neighborhood might be kind of a stretch. I don't know how like urban sheep get, I mean, not that Bethlehem would have been urban, but you know what I mean. Anyway, um, suddenly God's angel stood among them and God's glory blazed around them. They were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody, 
worldwide. A Savior has just been born in David's town, a Savior who is Messiah and Master. This is what you are to look for, a baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. At once, the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in the heavenly heights, peace to all men and women on earth who please him. The, the word um, anthropos, um, we often hear as like peace, goodwill to men, etc. Um, it's definitely not exclusively dudes, like it, it is humankind. Uh, I would kind of prefer humankind rather than men and women because that uh, is actually more expansive, but it, I, I mean, you know, at least it's not just, you know, happy Christmas to the dudes and the ladies can get back to the kitchen or whatever. Smash the patriarchy. Um, as the angel choir withdrew into heaven, the angels talked it over. Let, let's get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. They left running and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Seeing was believing. They told everyone they met what the angels had said about this child. All who heard the shepherds were impressed. Mary kept all these things to herself, holding them dear, deep within herself. The shepherds returned and let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen. It turned out exactly the way they'd been told. This is the word of the Lord. Like that, the shepherds let loose. It's, you know, I mean, I mean yeah. Like, like especially uh, like the King James Version, if you're ever hearing um, the Christmas story, especially as told by Charlie Brown, etc. Um, it's kind of more formal uh, language with like the, the swaddling claws and the kind of uh, austere angels with a very formal presentation. Um, and even like rejoicing, but like here with they let loose. That's yeah, kind of more down to earth. I like that. Uh, so. I also wanted to read uh, the artist statement that uh, the Reverend Lyle Gwyn Garrity wrote to go along with this beautiful piece, backwards, um, How God Shows Up. So this is the statement that she wrote about uh, creating it. She writes, This year, I come to this story with deep reverence for the complexity and beauty of childbirth. Oh, also, side note, um, a sanctified art um, who put together uh, this ser the series with uh, the prayers and poetry and art and, and other things, um, they uh, come out with an Advent series and a Lent series and often another for the summer. Uh, this past year, they did not create anything for the summer because like half of the creative team was off on maternity leave. Um, anyway, back to, back to Lyle's statement. Uh, this year, I come to this story with deep reverence for the complexity and beauty of childbirth. At the time of creating this art, I am about six weeks away from giving birth to my first child, who will be born in the same hospital where my mom died from cancer 20 years ago. My daughter will take her first breath in the same place where I heard my mother's last exhale. Much of my pregnancy has been a journey of healing, of inviting joy into the house where my grief lives, of preparing to become a mother as a motherless child. The more I learn of others' experiences around birth, I realize how closely joy and grief can coexist in each of our stories. And so as I return to Jesus's birth story, my imagination leads me to wonder about how Mary experienced both grief and joy. Apart from Elizabeth, did she have support throughout her pregnancy? Was her own mother involved? Did she have generational trauma she needed to grieve? Did the stress of their travels to Bethlehem cause her labor to happen sooner than expected? As she labored, did a midwife come? Was she afraid? In this image, as if looking past a curtain, we peer into this threshold moment when excruciating pain gives way to ecstatic joy as Mary draws her baby to her chest and he takes in his first breath. As Mary holds her baby, additional hands reach in to support them both. Maybe these are the hands of strangers, of Joseph, of, or of, of a midwife who was summoned. Perhaps they are simply the hands of angels. Each year we tell this story because it is raw with joy, pain, and the complexities of being human. No matter how your story is unfolding, 
May you find that this sacred story holds space for you. For this is how God shows up. In a child who cries, in hands that hold, in human flesh, in life and in death. as what the artist had to say about this piece. Uh, I think that, that's beautiful of inviting joy into a house of grief and all of those human experiences being embodied in the same moment. It's, it's lovely. Um, yeah, and, and also like the way that like Mary is crying, like is that because I am under the impression that uh, childbirth is like frickin' painful? Um, I wouldn't know, I just have a cat. Um, or are they like, just she crying because she's afraid? Or are they like tears of joy? But like that kind of ambiguity altogether in one um, image. And I've definitely uh, been told, especially as like a kid in Sunday school, I think that uh, Jesus was a perfect baby and like never cried. And uh, Mary's childbirth was entirely without pain and like super fast or whatever. And um, I'm sure that would have been great for Mary. <laughs> I would imagine, um, but it's also not exactly the human experience, and I'm um, pretty sure it's like not even biologically possible for a human infant to never cry if it's like you know alive, um, because I mean to be alive is to, to scream into the, the void really of, of darkness. And anyway, uh, a nihilism joke. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, G Jesus never crying is just such a weird like. If he's fully human, then, I mean, anyway. Um, yeah, we, uh, last year we read through some of the, as I like to call them, weird gospels, or like the non-canonical ones that were written several centuries later and didn't make it into the Bible for like kind of occasionally obvious reasons, uh, especially the one with uh, dragons and the nativity, because like in our Bible, there aren't actually any animals that are ever mentioned as being uh, in, in, in the scene when Jesus is born. Um, so like when we think of animals being present, um, it's from these non-canonical gospel stories that do like uh, mention animals and dragons. Um, it's weird how I've never come across like a non-canonically biblically accurate dragon nativity scene. Like I want one and anyway. Uh, I mean accurate is kind of relative statement there because the non, anyway, the, t t entirely whatever. Um, yeah, so anyway, point being this is a beautiful piece of art was, was, the, was the point that I was that I was getting at there. Uh, so again, uh, happy Christmas. Um, I appear to have moved my camera over, eh, whatever. Um, it's been a busy month and we're just gonna roll with what happens here. So uh, Merry Christmas. I hope that you will uh, join me tomorrow night for another uh, Wednesday evening prayer. Um, and uh, even though New Year's Day happens to fall on a Sunday this year, if you are awake and conscious, you know, about 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, we would love to have you join, join us at church for a kind of a low key uh, lessons and carols kind of uh, style of service. Um, if you would rather come in PJs that, yeah, it's fine, you know, kind of PJs. Um, there, there is, there's much to celebrate and that doesn't always have to be formally dressed. Uh, I mean, clearly, you know, birthday party hat Jesus um, is, you know, anyway. Uh, point being, uh, Happy New Year in a few days, and I hope to see you on Sunday uh, as we continue the uh, season of Christmas. So, excuse me. <clears throat> Good night.